Should I just go? Um, uh, I'd like them on, if that doesn't matter. Yeah, I like being able to see people. It's helpful to me. Um, I don't really care about any of their opinion. If you guys want the lights off uh, elsewhere, I guess. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, reverse engineering and uh, in particular uh, a project I worked on for a few weeks for a friend of mine and uh, hopefully impart some information to y'all starting with I'm Mog. Hi everybody, I'm Mog. I'm Way in the back, that's my friend Will Pig. Say hi Will Pig. It's Will Pig's birthday. Now, we can't sing a song because it couldn't be posted, but if everybody could wish him a happy birthday, I would really appreciate it. Happy Thank you. <laughs> okay. Now to unimportant stuff. Um, I'm a hacker uh, with Makers Local 256. It's, it's a make space in uh, Huntsville, Alabama, a little bit of a ways from here. Um, we do a lot of fun stuff, uh, just about anything you can imagine, I would say. And uh, so now I guess I will have to tell you what the talk is actually about. Um, this is what I think reverse engineering is. Um, I guess not the definitive definition. I think it's the act of taking apart a system, figuring out um, you know, all the in internals and understanding each individual aspect of it, um, being able to clone it, so to make your own, and then finally being able to improve it or uh, change it, um, I, I guess you could say, it, could get worse, but as long as it suits your needs, it's better. And so I would say that uh, having the tools to be able to do that um, with products and uh, systems in your life is a very uh, a essential tool um, in today. So I talked about it. So why why is it essential? Why does why do people need to know how to take things apart? Um, especially so, reinventing the wheel is dumb. There were a lot of talks uh, this week about 3D printers and, and making parts like your shower head and other random uh, trinkets like uh, keychains. I have a really cool, oh, it's not here. Uh, I have a really cool uh, keychain that I printed on a 3D printer. But for a lot of things, the mass produced item is effective, it's cheap, it's easy to replace, it's easy to get parts for. So working within things that already exist. Can, can be very beneficial. So don't reinvent the wheel. That's stupid. It's a good wheel. And then, like I was saying, it's, it's cheaper to reuse, reuse parts that already exist um, because of the, just the, there's so many. And then, if you really understand the wheel, maybe it is good to reinvent it. But, but if you don't understand the, the problems uh, of, a, of a product, you, you can't make a better version of it, it unless you have knowledge. And so, this project that I worked on was, I called it uh, Closed Sesame because it turns out there's already a project called Open Sesame, <laughs> which is a language project. And I was very disappointed because I already like made the Git repo and everything. And I was just like, oh, that sucks. So Closed Sesame, it's just as good. Um, it's, a, it's a lock uh, that I started. And so it kind of got a, its roots from a previous project. This is a our lock on our makerspace. Uh, we use a quick set power bolt to uh, lock and unlock our door. We have uh, USB keys that we stick into the uh, into a keyhole right by the door. It detects the USB vendor ID on it and then it opens the door for you so you can get into your hackerspace. It's a very cool project. It was made like almost 10 years ago now um, at, our, at our makers local. And so the nice thing about it, though, is that it was so simple. The uh, quick set locks used a, um, had the open and close pins for their lock controller exposed. So if you just applied current, it would open the lock. If you applied current to the other pad, it would close the lock. So it was very trivial electronically to, to build this device. It was just an Arduino and um, some sensors to know if the door was open or closed. So we didn't try to like lock the door while it was open and then leave the shop open. And so that was that. And then, so this is a picture of the old lock. Um, where's my mouse? So as you can see, there's just the pads for the open. Or do you guys not see the mouse? Oh, you do. OK, so there's the pads just for the open and then a pad for the close. So you could just solder wires to it. 
worked really well. Um, ran off six uh, or four AA batteries, works great most of the time. Sometimes we have batteries go dead, nobody can get in the shop, it's unfortunate. Uh, and so uh, a member of the shop uh, was like, oh, I love this lock, works great here, I'm gonna buy some myself. And so he found a deal on eBay for four of them. But unfortunately for him, it's the new version. And the new version is much improved. Uh, if you can see, it has this little home connect symbol, which means it supports Z-Wave, which is a wireless standard, kind of like a Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, but uh, intended to do home automation and machine automation, lots of fun stuff. Um, but the problem is, it's not simple to control. It's this guy. So as you can see, there are no really pads exposed. Um, there's some debug headers for the microcontroller uh, right here, but those don't really do it. Like if you apply current to them, they don't do anything effective. They turn the lock off. It's kind of frustrating. Uh, and so he was stuck. He couldn't uh, do anything with it. And uh, he started to take it apart and wanted some help with it. And so I said, sure, let's do it. And then I thought, talk for hope, sure. That'll make me actually finish. And so we got started on it. And uh, this is, I guess, where the more reverse engineering side comes in. This is how I think the effective way to take, uh, take something from scratch and get it done. So I think you need to start off by creating two lists. The first list is what do I know? I think people, uh, when you get something like this, you just want to immediately start probing pins and <sighs> tying things together and trying to figure out the fastest way to get the object to do what you want it to do. And the problem with that is you make a lot of assumptions. Uh, in particular, I think what most people do is what, what they do know or what, what they, their list of what I do know is really what they think they know, what they think different parts do. And so you really have to go with the bare essentials and figure out uh, what you know. And the other list is the things you think you know, the things that could change but you, you want to write them down so that as you're collecting all this data, you don't, you don't have uh, conflicting thoughts in your, in, your, in your head. You need to know what, what you saw because um, you're going to see a lot of stuff. And so, next slide. So the what I know, um, with this lock, I immediately, uh, I found the, this is the module it ships with. This is the, the Z-Wave module. Um, Looking at it, I was able to find uh, the part number for this module right here. And with that, you can find the data sheets and explains like, what all of these pins do. And so you can begin to map the schematic of the board. So by doing that, I was able to tell that this board talked to a memory chip on the back. That's where this board stores all of its information about like the passcodes and other uh, uh, preferences and stuff that's put into the lock. Um, it also uh, talks to the uh, main board over UART, which is a, just a serial communication protocol, just like uh, uh, those old DB9 serial connectors that everybody uses. Um, so I was able to find out where those pins were, and that really set everything way ahead because uh, knowing, knowing those things, uh, you could actually begin to, to, to look at traffic and, and get going. Um, one of the other things that's real easy to find out is to map all the ground points on the board that matters. So uh, you know that the back of the battery uh, is going to be the ground. It'll be ground throughout the board, most likely. And so you can test by t putting a meter and checking for ground on, um, on that pen, and then you can go to other pens. And so doing that, I was able to map uh, all the ground pens on the daughter board connector. And so um, that you know, took off four pins right there. There are uh, 14 pins on the back connector. And so being able to see that stuff, it, it gives you a, a good, good grounding. And then the other thing that I did after that is I, I was really excited when I found the, the Z-Wave module. So I kind of didn't look at any of the other data sheets. Um, it turns out the data sheets for everything on the daughter board were available. Um, they're all just stock parts that you could buy yourself, actually. And so I found the data sheet for the SPY module. That's the memory that was uh, the Z-Wave controller used. And then I also found there on the back side, 
There are two I2C chips. Uh, it has a real-time clock on this and a uh, data, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, another memory chip for the real-time clock. Like I said, this is significantly more complicated than the last lock <laughs> for seemingly no reason. <laughs> but uh, so I was able to figure all that out. And that's, that's what, what I knew. And then from, from after we've collected all this data, we could begin probing things and trying to, to see what was going on when the lock was functioning properly. And so one of the first things we did was try to assess the pinout of, of the board. Um, so the best, the easiest way to do that is uh, multimeter continuity testing. So uh, this is pretty average multimeter to Unity. They're cheap. I like them. And they have a mode where, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this, you just touch the pins together and it makes, this is going to be great for sound. Can't find it. There it goes. Anyways, makes a beep when you, the pins touch. That means the you have found one end of the wire all the way to another end of the wire. And so what you can do is you go pin one, and then you try to find how it snakes through the PCB all the way to where it comes out the other end. And then you just note that down over and over and over again. Um, and then once you've done that, almost all of the pins terminate at one of the other ICs and the IC the database or the data sheet for the IC says this is what this pin is and so then now you know that pin one is a uh, uh, is connected to the voltage of the battery or pin three is not connected so you can you can find where everything goes um, and then after you've done that then the next thing you really have to do is voltage test everything so this board um, runs at 3.3 volts, um, but the battery supply actually is uh, 6 volts because it's four double A's. And so one of the things you have to check for is to, to be sure that each of these pins is actually 3.3 volt tolerant because you don't want to cook your equipment that you're, you're using to test it. And so uh, it's, it's helpful to get an idea of what each pin is doing by measuring the voltage that's on it at any given point. And, uh, like that's how we found the, the battery pins. Uh, the battery pins were high at six volts, but everything else was either floating in ground or high at three volts. And so um, that's a good step to take. Uh, I burnt a lot of equipment not doing that. Uh, connecting stuff that's only like 1.8 volt tolerant to a nine volt pin, uh, you get some blue smoke pretty quickly. Um, and so after we did that, um, there's a very helpful tool called a logic analyzer. Um, I have two of them with me today. Uh, the OpenBench logic analyzer is a really inexpensive uh, open hardware device that uh, you can get from SparkFun or uh, Seed Studio. And it has a little bit of memory, um, but enough to be, to be useful. And I was able to connect uh, all the pins that I wasn't sure of what we're doing, I was able to connect to each one of them and then power the device up and capture all the traffic on the pin. And I would see every time the, the pin would go high or low and then um, for a period of a few hundred milliseconds. So not a long time, but enough to, to try to figure out what the device was doing. And so I was able to ascertain which were the I2C pins, which were the uh, UART pins correctly and uh, able, able to move on from there. Uh, it's a more difficult tool to use, but it's, it's pretty much can solve any problem uh, that you throw at it. Um, then the, so once you have a, good understand, a better understanding of what, or you think you do, you don't necessarily, because we were wrong about some of this stuff, but once you think you have a better understanding of it, you can start monitoring traffic on the board. So what we used to do that was another tool. Um, it's called a bus pirate. Does it, everybody know what a bus pirate is? Some people. Uh, bus pirates, little guy like this, also sold seed, spark everywhere. And the nice thing about it is you plug it into your computer. You tell it um, to expect spy, UART, um, I2C, single wire, Dallas, all these different protocols. And it'll decode them for you on your screen and show you the binary representation of what's being sent across the wire. So with that, we were able to uh, 
to capture our first real chunk of data. So this is something I saw on pin 8 as I triggered the lock from a Z-Wave device. So that's a, those are two messages that were sent across the wire. At the time, we didn't know what they meant, but they fired um, routinely every time we fired the lock. And so we were pretty happy. And then we did the other side of it as well. So the other pin um, was pin 6, and we watched it, and we saw how the module or the, the lock responded to the module when it said, lock me. And so we didn't really know what any of that meant, but we knew we were on the right trail because those were the pins that were active when things were locked or unlocked. Everything else kind of stayed dead. The uh, other chips didn't seem to really matter much uh, in the conversation between the two boards. And so we started trying to figure out what these messages meant because I'm not sure, I don't know how to go back, yeah. Like that means nothing to me right now. Um, I'm sure some of you guys might have noticed like the repeated data, uh, like, like this OX04. I'm not sure if I figured out that it's four bytes after that. It's kind of standard uh, encoding. But so we tried to, we looked at a, a whole bunch of messages. Uh, we had the status messages. There, we found a battery status message, uh, a command when it registers the device, unregisters the device, locks, unlocks, adds a code, deletes a code, and what happened when we sent it garbage it would respond saying, I don't know what to do with you. And so we, we got about to trying to figure out what these uh, codes actually meant. So this, was, this is what happens when you tell the lock to add the code uh, one, two, three, four. And so we tried to figure out what it meant. So the first thing, um, you guys, was moving really fast, but the OXBD is always the address of the uh, module going to the lock is that we saw. So every message that came from the module going to the lock always leads off with OXBD. And then OXOA, in this case, is the length of everything following it, like I said before. So that's 10 bytes following, uh, following it. The next we saw, we kind of figured out, was actually a sequence number. So every time the module sent a message to the lock, it seemed to increment this number. Um, again and again and again. And uh, the next also always seemed to be the same was uh, OXE7. That's the address of the, uh, where we're sending the message, in this case, the, the lock. And then we found um, after every time, there's always this one. So there's OXOB, uh, and that's the command type uh, that the lock is going to interpret. And then the lock so supports. Uh, I think it's 120 lock codes once you have uh, add the Z-Wave module. And for some reason, it uses two bytes to store that. So there are 1,020, no, not 1,024, 65,533 five options to fill 100 slots. But that's OK. And then this is actually uh, one of the sillier things. Is, so that's the passcode 1234. The, the lock only actually has five buttons. So there's a 1-2 button. A uh, three four button, a five six button, a seven eight button, and a nine zero button, and they display it in the code as that exactly in hex. So it's one two, one two three four three four. So that's one two three four. Um, that really kind of threw me off for a little bit because I just I thought that was like an ASCII code or something, and I was like it's way too low, and they repeat. And it just was weird, and then I just looked at the lock and I felt really stupid, <laughs> but uh, it's okay. And then this last one threw me for a long time. Um, I was pretty sure it was a checksum because if I made any changes to this message as a whole, uh, I would always get an error code back from the lock. Um, but I couldn't figure out how it was formulated. Um, it turns out it's a LRC checksum, which is a common single byte checksum used in a lot of wire protocols. But uh, I'll get back to that in a second. So, so then I try. What have I tried? So these are things you should do once you you know have an ask, an understanding of how the system works. So one of the things was reduce complexity. So in the like I said before, I noticed that the other chips don't seem to talk to the lock in any given standard configuration that I saw. So adding codes, deleting codes, using it, unlocking it, getting status updates, it never talked to the real time clock. I, I imagine that it's there for some kind of alarm 
or maybe you can put it in vacation mode or uh, other weird features that my friend had no interest in and I have no interest in. And so one of the first things we did, we decided to not mess with the I2C bus at all because we didn't need it. So when you're, when you're trying to, to get things working, if, if it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Leave it alone. <laughs> so that's, that, was, that saved a lot of time. And then the next thing that I was talking about was a replay attack. So once I had figured out all those messages, I could just send the messages over and over again. I'd send the lock and unlock that I'd captured, and it works. So I had already achieved the majority of function I needed for this lock without knowing anything about the lock. Like I, I, I didn't know how these messages really worked, but I, I was able to just repeat what it had already done I could lock the code. I could lock the door. I could unlock the door. I could even add codes as long as they were codes I had added in the past. So, like, I added one, two, three, four again, and it added one, two, three, four, and I deleted it, and it deleted it. But if I made any changes to any of those things, so like, if I wanted one, three, five, seven, which is different, uh, it would not work because the checksum wouldn't match. And so that wasn't acceptable. We had to figure it out more. Um, so. The next thing that you should try is called fuzzing. Fuzzing is when you send messages that are close to correct to the lock to see how it reacts. So a lot of, um, a lot of the time when you're dealing with microcontrollers, they don't have a lot of room for error codes or, uh, or, or helpful error handling. So if you send it garbage, you could get something interesting back out. And so one of the first things I tried was I sent uh, I incremented the uh, what should we call it the the sequence number by one, and then I tried every single possible checksum to see if I could get the the lock to move, and eventually it did because I actually had a collision of where the checksum was correct, and uh, and that was great. But realistically, given that the, it was a real checksum, uh, I would never be able to like to map all of the possible correct data entry points, I would probably end up with like a table uh, a gigabyte big rather than just figuring out the checksum. And the way the device worked, if the checksum didn't match, the, it, it didn't do anything. It just reported back an error. And so in this case, fuzzing wasn't very fruitful. But uh, in some cases, you'd be amazed that if, if you send a chip garbage, it, it will do exactly what you want or it'll put the chip in a bad state and you can get more data out of it. And so it's definitely worth trying. Um, and the final thing is search engines. And this is something that we should have done sooner. Uh, in looking at the messages that I sent, uh, oh, that's going the wrong way. Uh, mistakes, yes. Uh, so this message, I basically put it into Google. And I found out. By doing that, the Z-Wave module is actually sending Z-Wave code all the way down into the microcontroller. So this message is actually a standard Z-Wave message, except for the first byte has been removed that, talks, that mentions the Z-Wave controller. So otherwise, it's a standard Z-Wave message, which was great because the checksum Z-Wave uses is a documented thing. It's this LRC checksum. It's very easy to implement. It's like four lines. We did that, and bam, everything worked. <laughs> and that was like a week wasted because I couldn't freaking Google. <laughs> so always, always look around. Because uh, even though no one, has, no one has attacked this lock that I found, uh, the information was out there ready. I just didn't look. So, uh, so do that. That's a positive thing. Um, the next thing you need to do is to make a prototype. So um, it's hard for you guys to see, um, but the pin pitch on this is 0.8 millimeters, uh, or no, 0.08. No, 0.08 inches and something millimeters, uh, or two millimeters, yes. Anyways, it's awful to try to attach probes to. Uh, you will waste a lot of time doing that because the little clips will fall off or you're going to have to hold pressure, and it's a pain in the ass. And so one of the things I would recommend doing is it's very inexpensive to get PCBs made. Um, 
And if you do it right, you can future-proof them to some degree and still use them. So early on in the process, I designed this PCB uh, right here. And you can see it's designed to actually take a microcontroller um, to do the work. But it's also designed to just be a breakout board. So I have all the pins routed um, to pins on, on these side pins. So I can connect a standard header. So like this is a standard serial header that I can just plug in. And if the microcontroller wasn't here, I could talk to the lock directly from my PC and write software and, and get things done faster. And so when I was doing this, I, I had it set up. Uh, I had C code that would, would try to do a lot of these things that I talked about. Um, and, and it saves a whole lot of time if you do that. Um, and in fact, I was able even, there's so much space because this board really doesn't do a whole lot that I was even able to route the, the pins that I didn't get to, the I2C pins right here. Uh, they're future. Somebody can figure out what the clock was supposed to do if they wanted to. But, um, and so doing that is awesome. And mistakes. So like I already said, uh, going out of order is a huge mistake. You will waste so much time if you try to go quickly. Just getting everything figured out first is tedious and frustrating and writing it all down seems like a waste but it is incredibly helpful um, and everybody should do it i cannot stress it more um, not searching the internet enough uh, even if you think you're doing something that no one's ever done before you're not everyone's done everything <laughs> you are not a unique snowflake it's out there definitely keep looking um, not verifying power. Oh, so this is the most embarrassing mistake. So I finished the project uh, right before I got to Hope. And I even wrote a, a little app for it, a little Android app that does the Bluetooth. Uh, my version of it actually doesn't use Z-Wave because my friend doesn't want Z-Wave. He wanted Bluetooth low energy. And so I built one that used Bluetooth low energy. And the problem I had with it was when you uh, activate the lock, for a brief moment, all the power leaves the board, uh, leaves the module. And I'm sure that their board actually has a capacitor that's big enough to deal with that. I did not plan for that. And so every time my board locks the board, it reboots. And that's a little embarrassing. It's also difficult to get in. Uh, come on. Point 0.8 pitch or whatever is awful, and no one should be allowed to make it. It's like just slightly smaller than one in. Okay. So this is in, and I'll be able to show you all a second here. Hope so. Without, without this USB cable plugged into my laptop, the board would lose power and, oh, popped out. Yeah, like I said, point 0.8 does not hold anything in. Uh, when the lock is actually put together, it has like plastic to hold this board down better, but it's, it's awful. Uh, bear with me. Nope. Off by one. God. Stupid. How is everybody today? <laughs> there we go. Okay. So, makes the beep. Which means I'll have to do this real quick. So yeah. Here we go. So I will scan for the device and connect to it. And now I can lock. It's already locked. I can unlock. I'm not sure if you can hear that beautiful lock noise. Probably not. So, 
everything works on it. You can get the status and uh, whatnot. But if I unplug this USB thing, as soon as I do it, they'll reboot. Yep. It was unhappy. So it doesn't work. So if, if you aren't accurate on all your assumptions, you can end up with something that's garbage right now and not a very good demo for Hope. Um, and the other thing, like I said, if you ever think you've made enough notes, you have not, make a few more. It, it'll save you a lot of time. Um, I thought I'd tell you guys the kind of tools I use and what I recommend. Um, Bus Pirate, definitely. It's like $30. It's totally worth it. Uh, it can do everything. It can uh, even be used slightly as a multimeter in some edge cases and uh, power supply as well. It's, it's just amazing. Um, I forgot to bring it, but uh, there's a thing called a C. Uh, it was made by Nonolith Labs. It was a Kickstarter a couple years back. It's a analog uh, version of the bus part, basically. It allows you to source or detect uh, voltage and amps. Uh, it's great. Like when I was working on this, I used it to power the, the door lock, so I could turn the door lock on and off in software every time I caused a screw up that caused the door to crash to the point where it wouldn't talk to me anymore, so I didn't have to get up and pull the damn batteries out again and again. Um, so it's awesome. Uh, uh, this, this multimeter is awesome as well. It's a common word I'm using. Uh, one of the nice things about it is it, has, uh, it comes with a serial cable. So you can plug it in your computer and data log as well. It is very inexpensive too because I'm incredibly cheap. So it's good for that. Uh, OpenBench Logic Analyzer is this tool I used earlier. It is by far the most difficult tool out of these to use. Um, so I wouldn't recommend it for like a beginner, I guess. But it's also probably the most useful at going into the dark on something and figuring out what it was. Uh, when we started, we really didn't know what the pins were. And we should have, because we should have just Googled, like I keep saying. But we didn't. And so with that, we were able to tell, uh, you know, it was a 9600 baud serial port um, pretty quickly with this. Um, and it would have taken us a lot longer with other tools. Um, the other thing I, I recommend is an Arduino. In particular, I like Leonardo, because you get two UARTs. You have a USB UART that goes directly into the PC. And then you have a the two pin UART, which you can use to connect serial to another device. Um, I also just love Arduinos. Do people love Arduinos? Yeah, Arduinos are cool. Um. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. <laughs> um, finally, uh, I'm a big uh, free software hippie. Um, I recommend JITA and Emacs. Uh, JITA is what I designed the PCB in. Uh, it allows you to do stuff really fast. And I used Emacs to write this presentation and then put it into LibreOffice. And I use it for everything. Uh, everyone should use Emacs for everything, especially Matt. Um, so I think that's it. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes? Do you use uh, org mode? Org mode all the time. No, I, I, I just typed it all out uh, the other, uh, a few nights back and uh, then b dumped it in. I use org mode, though, for day-to-day -day stuff. Very cool. Uh, in fact, I was going to show you guys while questions were going. Uh, this is uh, about two weeks ago or three weeks ago, I did the entire board design uh, in a night. And so this is pretty sped up, but uh, I'm kind of show y'all, this is from absolutely nothing, making the Git repos, uh, forgetting how to make Git repos properly. Uh, my, my continuous integration script so that, uh, I work with a friend a lot and he doesn't like make, and so he hates, I, th that pretty image of the board, he hates having to do that himself. And so I wrote a script so that our Git, GitLab uh, instance has that automatically created for him, so he never has to bug me about it. Um, this is me kind of just doing initial layout of all the parts, um, putting them where they need to be. That's waiting for PCB to make those images, which is why my friend hates doing it. Uh, lots of stuff. Yeah, checking everything. Anybody else have any questions while this kind of goes? Yes? 
Yes. Um, so my friend Tim actually usually makes the footprints for me because I think that math is really hard. But uh, it's not too bad. Um, I actually did the footprint for the microcontroller on this board. Uh, it took me about 10 minutes. You'll see it here in, in about three seconds. It'll take three seconds, I mean. Uh, but I wouldn't steer anyone away from it. In fact, Tim and I, two years ago at Hope, gave a talk about using JITA and creating footprints and everything. And people should watch that because it's a better talk than this. Yes? Uh, so the, uh, the question was, did we try to read out the firmware? Um, in this case, there, there, two, there were two real chips that were uh, involved. There was the Z-Wave microcontroller, and then the, the lock itself has its own little microcontroller here. The, the lock microcontroller, we couldn't find any information about and uh, didn't really get anywhere with it. The Z-Wave module is... Uh, the firmware that runs on it is, 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 a, is part of it. It's not really dumped anywhere. The EEPROM that we found attached to it, it just stores preferences. And we found that. We found uh, the secret that was shared between the Z-Wave controller uh, host and the client. And our super secret 1234 passcode was in there. And a few other oddities that we didn't really figure out too much what were because we, we kind of thought that was a dead end. Uh, in theory, but uh, the, one of the the goals of the project was actually to not use Z-Wave because um, one of the problems with Z-Wave and why I think you haven't seen its adoption everywhere is it's it's very expensive. Uh, my friend Matt, Matt, how much was the the module that you have the controller? Two hundred and fifty dollars for the router, whereas I, we were using our phones to control ours. This is me buying stuff on Mouser. Please don't steal my credit card. Uh, yeah, that, that, that was the funny thing I think about this video is when I started this, um, it was hard for you guys to tell, I'm sure, but uh, I was going to use an Atmel um, chip for it because I use Atmels a lot, and then I was just going to use a radio module, and then I thought that was way too much work, and I was lazy. And so I searched for about 10 minutes there and found this RF module, and I was like, yeah, that'll do, and banged it all together. And this is me going through the documentation, making sure it will actually work as I build the part for it. Yes? So I totally get why you might lose people energy rather than Z-Wave or Z-Wave. People call it Z-Wave? That's, that's, what, that's what, I'm what I'm going to say from now on. That's so much better. But I was wondering if there's any interest in actually hacking Z-Wave into software defined radios and stuff and the whole project. Really? I haven't played with it that much. Um, I, I found the whole Z-Wave process a little interesting. Uh, I looked, when I was doing the documentation for this, I, I read about, uh, I think it's Open Z-Wave, which is an Open Z-Wave controller. I don't know what hardware it actually uses to talk to the other Z-Wave devices, but it does seem like there is some progress out there. Um, in it, I found that it actually, the Open Z-Wave controller actually supported this lock. Um, this lo uh, the Z-Wave uh, protocol, which kind of surprised me, it defines two different lock types. Um, and this is one of them. It's a door lock. It's supported by Z-Wave. Pretty standard. Yes? I don't mean to start a firmware or anything, but why uh, GDA instead of KiCad? Why GDA instead of KiCad? Yeah. So KiCad is awesome. And it's actually, KiCad in long term is going to be even more awesome than GDA, I would say. Especially since, uh, I'm not sure if people are aware, but CERN is like backing KiCad like crazy. Like, they just got push and shove routing, which is like so fucking sexy, and I'm very jealous. Um, but when when we started uh, working together, Tim and me, uh, we looked at KiCad, and it didn't really seem to support the workflow that worked best for us. Uh, he, my friend Tim, spends most of his time making footprints and then actually laying out traces on our PCBs. And I spend a lot of the time writing software and doing the schematics and, and connecting everything together. And so JITA allows you to, to separate those very well. And so um, that's how we did it. The other thing is I am a make fiend. I love make. And with JITA, I was able to script like so much stuff. Like if you, if you check out this repo and, and see the make file, I want a thank you.
because it's awesome. <laughs> I'm very proud of it. <laughs> yes? Uh, who do I use to print PCBs? Um, so I typically, and I actually, I think I'm on this board in a second, I think. Uh, I typically get my PCBs done by a guy named uh, Hack Vanna. He's on Freenode and Pound Hack Vanna. It's a uh, pretty cool place to hang out. Uh, a lot of people, all of his customers kind of hang out there and we talk about PCB design and uh, other kind of hobbyist stuff. Um, the only other company that I, I would recommend is OSH uh, Park. Osh Park, yeah. Um, I like that they are in very inexpensive and kind of timely. Uh, if you if you aren't in a, in a large rush and you just need prototypes, I think OS Park, OSH Park, uh, Osh Park is a great way to go. Um, but I really like Hackvana. Typically, lets me do really crazy things with my boards, uh, and I like that. And he also has very good prices in bulk. So uh, if you buy like a hundred boards, I think it's worth buying from him. I'm sorry? Develop the what? Oh, Hackvana, H-A-C-K-V-A-N-A. -A. Yes? So it seemed like, as somebody who's sort of new to this uh, hardware hacking, it seemed like one of the most difficult parts was um, interpreting the message that you got. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, you know, besides, because there was a lot of trial and error in that process, so besides using Google, are there any good software tools for analyzing um, patterns in a series of messages and to help you interpret them? So, I think what works best is, like I was saying before, is, is taking notes and getting lots and lots of data. So um, I think I can quit out of this. Uh, I'll make it bigger in a second. Uh, close this to me. So notes and uh, I think gedit will be easiest. What I think I know. So when I was... Uh, Attacking this, is this readable at all, or do I need to make it a lot bigger? Bigger? Does anybody know how to make things bigger in Gia? Probably this. Font, font, fonts and colors. Let's go big. It's great, okay. So uh, these are the kind of notes that I, I kept as I was uh, doing it, and, and most of it is actually just stream of consciousness. Um, some of it is wrong, actually, I would bet, and I just never went back and cleaned it. Um, but here is where I started just, I just, um, I wrote a program to print out the hex bytes, and I just started appending them to the log over and over again. And so actually, even here, you uh, see some stuff early on. For the most part, I always would get the correct thing but uh, occasionally I'd actually get garbage. And I didn't, I, I didn't know it was garbage at the time because exact, I didn't know there was a big enough pattern. And so I, I had to get a lot of data to get it down. But uh, over time, I, you, know, you, just, you get so much, it's, it's dead easy to see. Um, so like the, the majority of the message, I, I thought I understood very easily. Like for example, this is, uh, this is what happens when you unlock. So when you unlock, it's the standard header that I was talking about before, four bytes. Uh, sequence number seven and the addresses. The key, key uh, the command that's being sent is a seven, which is a status check, and then the checksum. And then it sent it again because the microcontroller was slow because it was sleeping. And it was like, give me the damn status. And uh, it finally replied back. Um, and then I said, okay, so the status was that the door was still locked. So then I sent this command, which is the lock command. 05 is the lock command. And so uh, it's pretty, uh, now it's pretty easy, obvious that th it was that. But even before that was clear to me, like when you look at the, uh, where's the lock from the web interface? I think 03, yeah. So when you look at the same thing here, uh, this is when I sent the lock command. So the lock command, you see the same kind of message preceding the lock actually firing that the unlock did. So it makes sense that that's gonna be a status message. And then 03 is the, is the command to lock the door. But um, I'm certain that I don't actually know all of the valid commands yet, uh, because some of the commands are more complicated, like the add code command has the, the slot, uh, another signifier, and then the data. So it, it, it can be trickier, but uh, it's a good, a good way to start is just to collect as much data as you can. Yes? 
uh, the slot was because later in here, um, so I entered multiple codes. So this code right here, it, it's wrapped, but so this is the adding the code 2244, and you'll see that in the slot space it's OX02, and I just entered the one before and it was OX01, and I entered another one and it was OX03, and so that appears to be what slot it's in. So, so the remove code seems to do the exact same thing. So uh, the code is OD for delete. I, th I like to think that somebody did that. It probably was just chance. <laughs> but uh, it's OD, and then it's, it's the slot number. And then they, do, uh, they verify that the code was actually deleted. You'll see OC is a, what is the status of this slot being fired right after it sent the delete key saying, did it really happen? Yes? That was a very funny thing I found. It only cares if it's the same sequence number. So the microcontroller was keeping track to say, did I already see this message? But only to that degree. So um, when, when I was doing my replay attacks, as long as I didn't send the same message repeated, so like if I, had, uh, I sent the lock command, the door locked, and then I physically unlocked it. If I sent the lock command again, because it was the exact same message and there hadn't been any in between, it assumed it had already seen that message and it dropped it on the floor. Um, and that's why I actually bothered with the sequence number, because you're right. Otherwise, it probably doesn't matter. Yes? Did you look for fixed lock codes? Fixed lock codes? Like essentially a backdoor where it's been put in there at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, actually, that is one of the things I did. Uh, when, I f when I got it all working, one of the problems I saw with it was uh, there's this, I didn't realize there was this unregister and register part of it. So the module, when, it, uh, when you connect it to the lock, you can send it a command saying, hey, I'm your new module, let's work together. And when it does that, it's supposed to delete all of the uh, lock, lock codes that it knows. And it actually does that. Um, and when you, um, and so, or, I'm sorry, when you unregister, it does that. And when you register, uh, the module will send over any lock codes it had already known in advance. Um, and so one of the things once before I'd figured that out was I wrote a routine that just scrolled through all the slots. And, and that's actually how I found out about the limit because when I hit like slot number 100, it started throwing me errors saying there is no such slot at, at that number. Um, and there were no hidden codes, fortunately. Uh, any other questions? Can we give Will Pick another happy birthday? Thanks.